Okay, we're going to get started here. I'd like to welcome you all to the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University. And uh, I'd like to welcome you for the first installment of a lectureship series that will be taking place this spring, entitling, entitled Revolution in the Arab World, The Long View. Tonight's talk uh, to introduce this is called the Unpredictable Present Reflections on Revolution in the Arab World. The lecture series and tonight's event are both spurred by recent events, first in Tunisia and then uh, still ongoing both in Tunisia and in Egypt, and a desire on our part to put together a set of interventions into public debate on the subjects, on the events that are unfolding, and not be merely reacting to current events, but trying to situate this in longer term contexts, histories, cultures, positions, actors, and so on. And to try to tease this out in as many ways as we can, and not thinking of it ser uh, solely as a, as a set of events that could be um, understood by solely one academic discipline. Tonight, we have four speakers. Our first speaker will be Osama Abi Marshad, who teaches in the Department of History at Georgetown University with a focus on North Africa. Our second speaker is James Collins, who teaches early modern French history also here at Georgetown University. Our third speaker will be Bassam Haddad, director of the Middle East Studies program. And, uh, and a professor in the Department of Public and International Affairs at George Mason University. He is also a visiting professor here at Georgetown University. And finally, myself, Elliot Kola. I'm, I teach Arabic here at Georgetown University. I will be the last speaker. So please, Professor Abi Merchant. Thanks, Elliot. Um, thank you, everyone, for, um, for attending. And I'm very glad to be able to um, speak in tandem with my colleague, uh, Jim Collins, tonight, because um, somewhere between the ousting of Ben Ali of Tunisia on January 14th and the beginning of the demonstrations in Egypt on January 25th, he and I had um, initiated a conversation by email about how we, uh, he as a historian of early modern Europe and I, of Can North. Speak into the microphone. We cannot hear you. Okay, and um, I, as a historian of North Africa, would situate uh, the Tunisian and Egyptian protests um, historically and comprehend them in theoretical as well as contextual terms. Now, obviously, our exchanges were um, somewhat complicated by the pace and the magnitude of the events, and it's beyond question that the recent developments in Tunisia and Egypt mark a, a watershed in the history of the two countries uh, with fundamental uh, even paradigmatic implications for the political landscape of the region as a whole and by extension for its relations with the world at large. And, um, you know, from the perspective of historians of the Middle East and North Africa, the repeated consensus that the region is now fundamentally transformed is more a thesis uh, than it is a verdict. And the thesis in question is whether the theoretical frameworks with which historians have typically analyzed social movements in the region are still able to interpret and explain the recent developments in meaningful ways. And there's nothing um, in, academic, in the academic training of historians that would give them the superior tools or the confidence to interpret um, events on the quick. In fact, historians are uh, notably reluctant to leap into the fray without caveat. And they're also notoriously inept at producing any grand social theory. However, because historians are not bound by or to one exclusive philosophy. They are happy to borrow from many social scientific disciplines and to deploy conceptual frameworks that render meaningful in both structural and empirical terms the patterns of human behavior and historical change. And this kind of theoretical cross-examination may prove particularly desirable and useful um, in the case of the recent protests in the Arab world because these demonstrations are dictating paradigm shifts of both political and conceptual dimensions. 
Like the Iranian Revolution of 1979, the protests of 2010-2011 are seismic in that they are sweeping away not only political regimes, but a particular worldview as well. Tunisia and Egypt have already shattered a number of dogmatic assumptions and presumptions about the exceptionalism of Arab societies, and they are challenging basic historical conventions on how revolutions will play out in the Arab world. As a result, it follows that we may need to reevaluate the prevailing academic notions on the nature of social movements and political action in the region. Now, at first glance, the protests are proving that the conventional wisdom on the Me Middle East and North Africa is out of step with developments in the region, especially at the level of ideological pluralism, popular culture, and mass media, or at least social media. Now, the larger problem is that the field of Middle East and North African studies remains mired in modernization theories and continues to be stultified by its associations with contentious geopolitical interests. And in addition, when it comes to the specific chapter on popular action in Arab Muslim societies, our historical understanding is still conditioned by the standoff between two philosophical and methodological um, schools of thought. Now, on one side, we have the proponents of the sociological histories of Max Weber and the socio-psychological theorems of Emile Durkheim. And to put things schematically, um, this school holds that every group action is a reflection of its commitments to a particular belief system. And studies inspired by the school have focused almost narrow-mindedly on the ways in which elites make use of ideology to gain political legitimacy. And in the context of the Middle East and North Africa, and especially since the Iranian Revolution of 1979, this school of thought has regarded Islam as the ultimate normative system, and its history of collective movements becomes an account of the role of Islam in shaping political action. Now, this is a view that has certainly nourished the narratives of the Arab authoritarian regimes themselves and of the conservative elements in Western and Israeli academia and policymaking. Now, according to the proponents of the school, the Arab security apparatus is the last bulwark against Islamic theocracies in the Iranian mold. Now, if anything, the recent events in Tunisia and Egypt should expose the limitations of this viewpoint. And one senses, a, uh, one senses consternation on the part of some analysts and commentators at the reality that something other than Islam may provide social and political cohesion for a mass protest movement in the Arab world. And this consternation comes across in the haste with which some scholars have rushed to describe the Tunisian and the Egyptian revolts as post-Islamist. It also comes across in how Western media channels have reported on the deployment of religious symbols by some of the protesters in the lens of the Western media, and this is especially true in the, in the early going. Um, it seems to me as I was watching uh, the news that the moment an Egyptian de demonstrators kneeled to pray, something significant happened in the way these events were reported. Um, this Egyptian demonstrator suddenly ceased to be a worker or a student or a trade unionist, trade unionist or a human rights activist and by automatic reflex, he was returned to the category, he or she uh, was returned to the category of a Muslim who by definition, according to the news report, was mobilized primarily by appeals to his or her religion. But it bears noting um, that this perception was among the first to be revised as the protests wore on and their pluralistic profile came to the fore. And so one senses that um, maybe something akin will take place at the level of, of scholarship. Now the second school is composed of um, neo-Marxist historians from, for whom shared aims and beliefs derive from shared interests. And social movements therefore are the result of shifts in the organization of production. Now here too is an interpretation I think that doesn't apply seamlessly to the Tunisian or the Egyptian context, especially when one takes into account that the demonstrators themselves have not justified their political actions by invoking the classic themes, symbols, and arguments of class struggle. The Egyptian and Tunisian protests may well be a revolt of the poor, 
But the demands of the demonstrators can't be uh, neatly categorized into ideological or class-based notions of justice. At least that's not, uh, not very obvious to me. And what seems to be absent um, in this perspective is an understanding of the historical processes that have contributed or that have congealed the lived experiences of Tunisians and Egyptians from all walks of life into one cohesive yet uh, largely leaderless uh, movement. And it's clear that due to our near obsession with the Islamism or secular authoritarianism dichotomy, we have not paid enough attention to the remarkable pluralism that has developed at the level of local, local politics and popular culture in Arab societies in at least, um, at least over the last two decades, if not longer. Now, for the last two weeks, as I've um, speculated on how scholarship may respond to the recent developments, um, I found myself turning to a European historian whose corrective notions of social class and ideology may suggest promising new perspectives for um, studies of the Middle East and North Africa. And it wouldn't be the first time that um, historians of the region have referenced the seminal writings of E.P. Thompson in the making of the English working class um, and the moral economy of the English crowd in the 18th century. But it seems now that the time is especially ripe uh, to revisit his central notions as they may pertain to Arab societies. And what I have in mind specifically is um, Thompson's redefinition of social class as a set of relations rather than structures. I think that this is one way that we may understand how unified political actions are able to be reconciled with broad, even trans-regional sociological or cultural interests. And likewise, another seminal or cardinal notion in, in Thompson's writing is, is the idea of the moral economy. Now, he uses this theme to show how the English bread writers in the 18th centuries were impelled by a socially and culturally grounded sense of justice. And I think that this is one notion that may help historians of the Middle East and North Africa. Also, um, it may also shed light on, the, um, on what's guiding the political, political actions of uh, the pro-democracy demonstrators today how this idea of a moral economy may be shaping the rituals of protest that we've been witnessing and providing them with some of the symbols that they've been using. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that Thompson's study of how social relations and cultural value, values coalesce into, an important, into a moral economy have important things to say about the dual dimensions of the Tunisian and the Egyptian movements. Vertically, uh, as a lens through which to analyze mobilization across wide segments um, of society, and horizontally to comprehend why and how the Tunisian riots have inspired similar movements that have resonated with local relevance from Morocco to uh, the Gulf. Now, we have heard um, the common slogans from Morocco to at least Jordan. We have seen the sharing of national flags uh, among the demonstrators, and we have also witnessed the tragic recurrence of self-immolation. So what are the, what are political and cultural historians um, to make of all this, of these commonalities, other than maybe that they must be connected to some sort of trans-regional uh, moral economy that emerges from a shared lived experience. Now, and there's another dimension um, to the idea of moral economy that may be interesting to investigate further, and it's that um, it may help us trace the impact of new technologies and mass media in shaping a shared popular culture and shaping a platform for political mobilization. Now, as one um, journalist recently noted, where activists were once defined by their causes, they are now defined by their tools, and I think that this is something that we as historians of Middle East North Africa need to start taking a little more seriously. Uh, it's obvious that um, electronic devices and the innovations in wireless communication, satellite television, independent media, and social media may now cultivate and sustain moral economies with which to knit together larger coalitions for political purpose, and then to connect them to national, regional, and global developments. In this sense, the micropolitics of protest can translate very quickly 
into a heightened awareness of political possibilities and of local gains to be made from extra local developments. And I think that this is obvious in the case of Egypt and the inspiration it's been getting from the Tunisian uh, precedent. Finally, the uh, moral economy may also clarify how the changing relations between government and society can determine the patterns of protest. And at minimum, the events in Tunisia and Egypt should prompt us to reevaluate Foucault's notion of governmentality as it applies to Arab authoritarian regimes. Now, this is an established relationship that is a paradigm in, in our studies, the, the authoritarianism of Arab governments. But it's clear now that this established relationship between Arab political authority and popular will has been largely shaken, and regimes are now being forced to reconsider the ways in which they enforce their legitimacy. If these regimes survive, um, as seems to be the case in Egypt for now, their immediate move will surely be to rethink their control over the state's institutional and symbolic repressive apparatuses. And as scholars, we should reflect on ways that Arab regimes may react to the growing vitality of the transnational and virtual networks that are at the heart of the uh, new moral economy. Now, some in this room may remember the 1970s song, The uh, Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Uh, this was a revolutionary song, obviously, that uh, parodied state control over the media and its ability to marginalize, if not suppress, dissent. Now, as a means to measure uh, how much times have changed since 1970, let's consider a revised slogan like the revolution will not be tweeted instead and speculate on some of the virtual wars we have witnessed in Egypt, from the attempts by the authorities to shut down the internet to the counterattempts by anonymous hackers to cripple the government's um, mainframe computers. Now, today, it seems to me that it makes just as much sense for activists to leave government buildings behind and stage protests against firms that sell internet and wireless tracking technologies to autocratic regimes. And this is a new dimension, I think, in the way we're trying to understand governmentality and political authority and how forms of uh, power get, um, un you know, are, are deployed throughout society. Now basically, as, um, as students of the, of the Middle East and North Africa, we've known for some time that the common thread of corrupt, authoritarian, and ruthless regimes has translated into a regional, uh, a regional social and political fault line. And what remains to be seen today, and where I hope that we can at least start um, a debate today, is um, to consider the reasons why or why not the moral outrage of the Tunisian and Egyptian people will uh, remain isolated eruptions or whether they will ignite um, a belt of fire along uh, this once dormant fault line. And I think I will stop here and thank you for your attention.